So the the empirical work that uh, that Pablo has presented uh, yielded a lot of rich information and was of course also founded on some uh, set of assumptions about the task, but uh, they had not been made explicit yet at that point. And so uh, we in this third intellectual output uh, IO3 set out to to summarize the conceptual foundations of. Uh, or the framework for our work, we, that is mainly um, Aline Remal, uh, who is with us here, and if you have any questions about what I'm presenting here, she will be happy also to answer questions. Um, we worked on this, and we also actually have already uh, uh, published the content of much of this presentation uh, last year in an article in Linguistica Antherpiensia. And in that work, we started out by um, reaffirming the hybrid nature of the task, which is derived from accessibility services that we call SDH, subtitling for the deaf and hard of hearing, but it's also performed live in real time, like simultaneous interpreting, and it's also interlingual, uh, like traditional subtitling as a form of ABT. So um, later on in work that uh, was done together with Pablo, and he has just mentioned that, we tried to uh, focus more on that and kind of put the concept of uh, speech-to-text interpreting or live titling on the map. And we chose to reaffirm that we want to have this on a map of translation. Translation in all its forms, intralingual, interlingual, intermodal, and as you know, there are uh, a lot of well-established modes of translation versus interpreting. Translation happening in a non-immediate way and interpreting being a real-time live performance. Um, and at the same time, we want to acknowledge that uh, this new concept, this novel task, comes from the field of accessibility or media accessibility. So this is how we wanted to position uh, the speech-to-text interpreting task or live titling next to other forms of things that have more to do with translation or more to do with interpreting. In this case, it's very clear that we consider speech-to-text interpreting or live titling as a form of interpreting. As has already been said, this live titling can be performed in an un intralingual or an interlingual fashion, and even though the course contains mm, several components also on intralingual, uh, we the focus here in the project is of course on interlingual um, speech-to-text interpreting or live titling that we uh, call transpeaking in order to uh, emphasize that what is involved is interlingual and involves interlingual translation as a component. This can be done, as Pablo has just said, in various ways. Uh, Keyboard-based techniques are listed here as well, but basically uh, we focus on re-speaking-based or trans-speaking-based uh, live uh, titling, which is the use of speech recognition software. So moving on from our mapping task to the task as such, a brief recap of how we conceive this task. It is um, a task that should take us from an audio source or an audio visual source to written text, live titles then. And all of this is designed for the purpose of giving access to the audio to a target audience or target viewers. And I think it's always important here uh, when we have this technical discussion to stress the ultimate purpose of this service, which is to give access to people who need this kind of access to uh, speech material. So the way we conceive of this task is a, a two-step uh, process. It has a human individual performing what we call trans-speaking in the main and first stage. And then uh, this trans-speaker interacts with software, with speech recognition software that converts the spoken output to written output. 
And then in addition, there may also be a need for editing, editing that can be performed either uh, by the trans speaker, him or herself, or be taken care of by a second person, depending on the workflow that is envisaged or possible. Uh, now, so much for the task. When we tried to look more closely at the process, we took inspiration from some processing models that uh, are in existence in the field of interpreting. For instance, Daniel Gilles' effort models. And in those terms, we can describe the process uh, of trans-speaking as being extremely complex, actually more complex than simultaneous interpreting. It consists of listening comprehension and analysis, of course, and production or strategic reformulation. But it has this important novel component also of working with the speech recognition software, dictating to the software in a way that will optimize the accuracy of recognition, dictating punctuation, for instance, and uh, other things. And in addition, the monitoring of the, the visual output and the coordination, as Daniel Gilles has also stressed, co coordination and control of attention to the various components of this complex process. In addition, as I said, there is also monitoring and correction needed in an editing stage and then you have an additional coordination task of making sure how much correction or editing is needed, how much editing the trans speaker could afford without uh, jeopardizing the flow of the trans speaking process. So extremely complex as a process, but that's only part of the analysis because beyond the cognitive microprocess, there is, as we know from interpreting models such as Silvia Kalinas, there is something that goes before you actually do the job. There is a pre-process phase and, as Silvia Kalina says, a peri-process component and also a post-process phase in this task. The pre-process tasks, for instance, would include preparing the speech recognition software, uh, preparing for the, the, the job as such, uh, ter preparing terminology, glossaries, and updating the database of the system so that the uh, recognition will be optimized. The PERI process involves interacting with other people in the workflow, and the uh, post-process tasks include debriefing, issues of quality, and uh, remedial work if necessary uh, to optimize the output. So this is the overall process in context for which we wanted to define uh, a competence profile. And so we go back to this uh, basic outline of the process, of the macro process, if you will, and we want to put uh, a, a profile of competences there. Once again, uh, in, within the field of translation studies, we were able to find inspiration in existing competence models, such as the work of the PACTE group in Barcelona, but also the most recent competence framework issued by the EMT, the European Masters in Translation Consortium. So since it, this is a uh, translational task in the broader sense, it includes some competences that are certainly not new, like uh, language and cultural knowledge, and also subject matter and world knowledge, but also skills in the area of dealing with other people, personal, interpersonal skills, and professional skills, like uh, actually carrying out an assignment and um, uh, sending someone the bill and negotiating and so on and so forth. So these are important competences in the competence profile but they are not unique, as we would claim, to uh, uh, interlingual speech-to-text interpreting. But the unique part comes under the heading of what we called technical methodological competence. And to look at a close-up of that, that, uh, in our mind, includes, first and foremost, knowledge and skills regarding the task and the process of trans-speaking. So, parts of which I've uh, described. This could be the basic introduction to, the, to the, that component. 
but also knowing how to prepare, knowing how to specifically do research, preparing for a job. And in this case, the preparation is unique and goes beyond what a, an interpreter would do for preparation because you also have to focus on preparing the software for uh, each job. Translation, of course, goes without saying, an important subcomponent of this technical methodological competence and multitasking, as we've tried to show, there are so many subtasks and operations to be coordinated that this multitasking becomes a primary challenge, and that also came up in the surveys that Pablo presented. There's also uh, a unique task of uh, skill of audiovisual monitoring as a foundation also for the editing task and uh, the editing as such, the correction, which could be done using the keyboard or uh, collaborating with a teammate. So this is the competence profile, the competence model that we ended up with. And um, those are the competences, especially the technical methodological competences that are to be acquired in the ILSA course. And that's what the course was designed for. We started out defining learning outcomes and, and then designing course materials. And that will, of course, be covered in the following presentations by my colleagues. Thank you very much. And on with it. Thank you, Franz. So now um, let's see whether there are questions. You Again, I repeat, you can ask questions via the chat box or by raising your hand. So uh, feel free to ask questions. OK, here we go. Now, so basically, how, how challenging uh, are those competences? Are they so difficult that it would limit the number of practitioners who could do this? Um, well, I think if our references to simultaneous interpreting, we could say this is probably not for everyone because it takes a very special uh, cognitive uh, activation uh, to, to, of, of several languages to do this. And so even though simultaneous interpreting is not for everyone, there are plenty of people who have those uh, linguistic and cognitive processing skills, attentional management skills that uh, can be trained in that task. And even though we say that uh, interlingual speech to text interpreting may be even more challenging than simultaneous interpreting, we do see it in a close relation. And so we don't think it is all that exclusive. Uh, rather, uh, in a program, for instance, that trains simultaneous interpreters, it would be quite conceivable that those who manage to complete that sort of training would also be uh, very promising candidates for successfully completing this course. 